heard of a lady just this past week who is a member of the church, a member of the Lord's church. She's married. She's got two beautiful children. And she was talking to another Christian lady. And she was talking about church and where they go to church. And they go to a well-known congregation there in Chattanooga. And she said, well, you know, we only go on Sunday morning and we don't do anything. We're not really involved in anything. And then we go home and don't go back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. And, you know, our daughter is a really good swimmer. And she has an opportunity to be a part of these swim meets. But these swim meets are on Sunday. And I just, you know, I just think that since God gave her this talent to swim, that God must want her to go to those swim meets, and then it's okay if we don't go to church. That is classic wisdom of the world. That is classic reasoning of men. And the problem is, that we Christians, we people in the church, and even those of us who are here on Sunday night and Wednesday night and every night of the gospel meeting and every day or night of vacation Bible school, we're not immune to it. We can give in to it at any time. And there is a tempter who tries to put these thoughts into our head. So what I'd like for us to think about for just a few minutes tonight is the wisdom of God. Proverbs 3, verse 19 and 20, said, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, and the skies drip with dew. You think about this for a second. Proverbs points out the obvious fact that God created the heavens and the earth, everything we see, and everything we experience. Now, if you make something, whether it's a table or a cake or a painting or a shirt, whatever it is, if you take raw materials and turn it into something else, who knows what's in that thing that you've made better than you? Who knows how big it is, how strong it is, how well it was done, where the mistakes are better than you? Nobody. God made it all. God knows what it's made of. He knows where the seams are. He knows every ingredient in its exact amount. He knows how long it took. And he knows what its best use is. Now that's what Proverbs is saying. In wisdom, God made everything. What is wisdom? Turn with me to Isaiah 28. I heard you turning your Bible a little bit ago, and I really love to hear that sound of those pages flipping. I don't, I've gotten to where I don't even mind people flipping a screen that doesn't even have pages as long as they're looking at their Bible app. Isaiah 28 paints a picture that I think many of us can relate to that explains what wisdom is. And in Isaiah 28, God, through Isaiah, is making the point that he's going to punish Israel, but he's telling them, I'm not going to punish you too bad. It's not going to be more than you can bear. It's not going to destroy you. It's going to be for your good. But to illustrate how he knows how much to punish and how long to punish, he uses the example of a farmer. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 of Isaiah 28. Does the farmer plow continually to plant seed? Does he continually turn and herald the ground? Does he not level its surface? We're going to read some more, but let's stop right there. 
Many of you, I'm sure, have plowed. I've never plowed with a mule or a horse, but I've plowed with a tractor. And I imagine most of the people, at least most of the men in this room have. You don't plow and plow and plow and plow and plow and plow and plow. You plow until the ground's broken up, and then you level it and get it ready for planting. That's wisdom. He's painting a picture of wisdom. You're going to see that in a second. Verse 25. And so dill and scatter cumin and plant wheat in rows, barley in its place, and rye within its area. He's saying, a wise farmer knows how to plow. He knows how to prepare the ground. He knows which seed to broadcast and which seed to plant in rows. He plants this seed over here and that seed over there. He even rotates his crops, probably. That's wisdom. That's what he's saying. Verse 26. For his God instructs and teaches him properly. For Now he talks about harvest and what you do when you bring the crop in. He says, For Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel driven over cumin. But Dill is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a club. Grain for bread is crushed. Indeed, he does not continue to thresh it forever because the wheel of his cart and his horses eventually damage it. He does not thresh it longer. He's saying, now a farmer who knows what he's doing knows how to separate the seed from the hull. He knows how to do what's necessary to get the kernel off the cob and get rid of the cob and keep the kernel. We have machines for that now, but people have to know how to do it. You have to know how to use the machine. That's wisdom. That's an example of wisdom. In different crops, you do different ways. You don't do dill and cumin the same way you do wheat. And if you do it for too long, you'll ruin the wheat. That's wisdom. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. Here it is. Who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. I think if you took this passage, you could distill wisdom down into three points. Number one, knowing what to do. Knowing that your ground needs to be prepared. Knowing that your cloth needs to be cut. Knowing that your flour needs to be sifted. Knowing what to do. Number two, knowing how to do it. Knowing not to mix too long. Knowing not to plow when it's too wet. Knowing not to crush the wrong seed. And number three, knowing when to do it. Doing it at the right time in the right way. That's wisdom. What to do, how to do it, when to do it. I think that's exactly what this lady was struggling with. She knows what to do. She knows that she needs to be a part of the Lord's church. She knows when to do it. She knows that the church is supposed to gather for worship on the first day of the week. But she's missing something on the how to do it. She's missing something on the full commitment. She's missing something on the dedication. She's missing something on the putting it above everything else. She's missing the how to do it. And that's what a lot of people are missing. Go with me to James. Wisdom comes from God. James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and he will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven tossed by the wind. You want wisdom? Look to God. You want to know what to do and how to do it and when to do it? Look to God. Pray about it and study God's Word. But when you look to God, trust God's answer. When you look to God, believe what God tells you. And when God tells you, don't cut your hay when you see the storm clouds gathering, trust what God tells you, because he's right. Every time. And if you're going to ask and then doubt, if you're going to ask and then waver, well, I hear what he says, but I'm not really sure, it's useless. It doesn't do you a bit of good. 
Come forward to James chapter 3. James 3 verse 13 tells us that wisdom is gentle. Think about this as we read these verses. Think about a person whom you know to be wise. Think about a person who, whether it's wisdom in life or wisdom in how to do something and how to do it well. Think if you've ever seen that person try to cram it down somebody else's throat. See if you've ever seen that person try to force another person to do it their way. Look at what he says about wisdom in James 3 verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. We're going to read the next couple of verses in a second, but I'm going to stop right here. He here says there's two kinds of wisdom. There's earthly wisdom and there's heavenly wisdom. There's human wisdom and godly wisdom. And there's a big difference between the two. And you think about what our culture teaches us. Our culture teaches... Do what feels good. Put yourself first. You got to look out for number one. That's human wisdom. That's earthly wisdom. What does it result in? Results in immorality. Results in school shootings. Results in neighborhoods you can't walk down the street. It results in all kinds of evil and disorder and hatred. Where does it come from? Look at verse 14. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. Human wisdom looks at the self. Human wisdom says, I'm the most important. And its reasoning says, whatever is good for me right now is right. Let's read verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Stop for just a second. Purity is difficult. Purity means you got to get out the competition. Anything that competes for control of your mind, anything that competes for control of your priorities, anything that competes for control of what you want and what you believe has got to go. The wisdom from above is first pure. It's got to be by itself, and it's got to get everything that competes with it out, all impurities. Then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Wisdom is knowing that you can't walk up to this lady who's confused about whether swim meets or worshiping God is more important and tell her, well, you're sending your kids straight to hell. That's not gentle. And if I call her up on the phone, not really even know her and tell her that, she would hang up on me and hate me for the rest of her life probably. And it wouldn't do a bit of good. That's not wisdom. It's not gentle. It's not peaceable. It's not helpful. Gentle wisdom is knowing how to do it and when to do it in addition to what to do. you got to have all three. And doing the right thing in the wrong way is often as bad as doing the wrong thing or doing nothing. Doing the right thing in the right way at the wrong time is often as bad as doing the wrong thing are doing nothing. With wisdom, you need all three. You gotta plant the right seed, you gotta plant it in the right way, but you gotta plant it at the right time. And that's what we need. That's what we need in every area of our life. God's wisdom is simple, but it's profound. Isaiah 55, verse 8, 
God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here comes the humility. To achieve true wisdom, to achieve the wisdom that God makes available to you, you have to demote your own view of yourself. You have to quit looking at yourself as self-sufficient. I can do it on my own. I don't need any help. I'll figure it out for myself. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. I'm tough enough. I'm mean enough to get where I need to go. You ain't going to get to God that way because his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And you'll never raise your thoughts to his. And his ways are higher than your ways. And you'll never build yours up to his. You have to reach up and let him reach down and pull you up. And if you're not willing to be helped by God, <coughs> you're never going to get there. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I mean chapter 1. We're going to look at a little bit in chapter 1 and a little bit in chapter 2. It's got a lot to say about wisdom and about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. But it also talks about the simplicity of wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul here says, and he's writing to people in Corinth, and these people are in Greece, and they are rich, wealthy people. It's a fantastically wealthy town. It's got all kinds of shipping and commerce, and these people have made a lot of money for a long time, and they think a lot of themselves. And Greek culture was all about intelligence and information and, and education and thought and argument, and even the things they teach in speech classes today go back to ancient Greece and what they taught about speech and argument way back then. And what he says here is, God has taken these people who think they're so smart, who think they're so wise, and has turned them upside down. He says, we preach the cross of Christ to Jews a stumbling block because Jews look for a sign. Jews want miracles. Jews want a kingdom on earth. Jews want authority. Jews want power. Jews want a dynasty, an empire, to put them back on top like they were when Solomon was here. They want a sign, a sign of a king, power, military, might. A cross? A guy put to death by Rome? He didn't, he didn't defeat Rome. They killed him like a common criminal. Foolishness. To Greeks, foolishness. Greeks want argument. They want fancy words and fancy thought and fancy logic. A guy killed on a cross? What good does that do for us? That's, that's crazy. But here's the simplicity of God's wisdom. God's wisdom is this. Man has sinned. He needs forgiveness. He can't pay his own debt. He can't correct his own sins and mistakes. So, God the Son, part of the Godhead, will become a man. He will be born into human flesh. He will live a sinless life. And he will sacrifice that life and shed his blood. And we will use that blood to pay off the debt of all the other men. Simple. But it's a cross. It's a man. 
and going to capital punishment, being tortured and murdered. To Jews a stumbling block, to Greeks foolishness, but to the call, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Simple, but profound. That's how the wisdom of God works in salvation. And salvation is only the beginning. Salvation is only the beginning of the wisdom that God has for every part of your life. Back here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2 verse 1. Paul says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Here it is. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. God does not want us to put our faith in men. He doesn't want us to put our faith in in preachers. He doesn't want us to put our faith in elders. He doesn't want us to put our faith in professors. He doesn't want us to put our faith in education. He wants us to put our faith in God, in the power of the cross. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Simple but profound. That's what He wants. And Paul says, that's exactly what I gave you. He says, I didn't come there and do all these crazy things and just wowed people with what a wonderful speaker I was and how I can just turn people and tie them into knots. I demonstrated the Spirit with the power of God. And I've told you the truth. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If you look back at uh, the first uh, chapter 1, verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. He's saying there weren't a lot of upper echelon people. These were people who were first converted. When you first were converted to the gospel, when you first came to the truth, you didn't come because it was the leading people of society. You didn't do it because it was the fad and the thing to do. You did it because it was true. It was true even though it didn't make sense. To those who thought they knew everything. Some people will never get it. I don't know who those people are. I know that anybody can come to the truth. I know anybody can come to faith. But the Bible also tells us that some just won't. And if you come down to verse 12 of chapter 2, he talks about that. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 2, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Now you remember, we started out in Proverbs where God created everything by wisdom. Okay, God's the one who knows. And now God is giving us what he knows. The things freely given to us by God, verse 13. Which things we also speak. Paul and the other apostles are speaking these things given by the creator himself. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? Notice this. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. God has written it down on paper and given it to us. The mind of Christ. The wisdom of God written down. But notice verse 14. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. A natural man is a person who only looks at the flesh. A natural man is a person who can't see beyond. And this is most of the people that we see in this world. Most of the people can see from birth, and usually only their own birth. There's a saying in history, for most people, history began at their own birth. Of course, we know that's crazy, but that's how most of us look at life. Most people see from birth to death, and death is a barrier beyond which they do not consider. 
And you think about a farmer. You think about a man who raises wheat, like he talks about in Isaiah 28. He knows about preparing the ground. He knows about sowing the seed. He knows about reaping the harvest. He knows about threshing the wheat and separating the seed from the whole. He knows how to crush it and turn it into flour. But imagine he's like me, and he knows nothing about the kitchen. You know, he can't turn that wheat into a loaf of bread or into a cracker or into a honey bun. He doesn't know that. He can only see to the grinding up of the flour. That's all he knows. That's the limit of his wisdom. Well, that's most people on earth. The limit of their wisdom is death. Death is the worst possible outcome. It's the thing to be avoided at all costs. It's awful. But God opens the door to death. And he allows us to see for eternity. And so we see not from birth, but from creation. And not to death, but through eternity. And so we are not limited the way most people who only see this life were able to see it all. That's what spiritually appraised means. Spiritually appraised means looking at it from a spiritual perspective and not limiting it to how it affects you in the body, but thinking about how it affects you for eternity. That's spiritual. And when you compare the short amount of time you're alive to the length of eternity, you realize that what happens in the flesh is completely unimportant, except to the extent that it affects eternity. Because eternity is so much longer that it dwarfs anything that can happen here. Spiritually appraised. Most of the people who are having an effect on our culture, most of the people who our children look up to, they don't spiritually appraise anything. It's all flesh. And there's a big controversy about a former Disney star taking her clothes off and dancing around on stage. And the only reason she's doing it is to get attention, and she she got everything she wanted. She's all over the paper. She's all on all the news channels. For a week, they talked about it. She's gotten all this attention, and she's going to make boo coodles of money. But we know there's a 98% chance that within five years... She'll be in drug rehab. Within 10 years, she'll be broke. And she'll be a ruined human being. Not very long from now. And maybe already is. Because that's the result of human fleshly wisdom. You need spiritual wisdom, which is from above. Look with me. We'll close in 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 15. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul says, From childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What are those sacred writings? Verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Teaching, reproof, correction, training, equipped, adequate. What's that? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Where does it come from? The scripture which is inspired by God. Sometimes you're faced with a choice. Sometimes you know what the Bible says. Sometimes you know exactly what the Word of God says. But you know that if you follow what the Word of God says, it's going to hurt. It's going to cause you some kind of pain. It's going to damage your relationship with your boss, or it's going to damage your relationship with your parents, or it's going to damage your relationship with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your friend friend. It's going to hurt. It's going to cost you something. And you're going to make a choice. My wisdom or God's wisdom? That's just a dog. I think he wants to hear the preaching tape. You're going to make a choice. Which one is it going to be? 
Your brain is going to tell you, protect yourself. Your brain is going to tell you, do what makes sense. Your brain is going to tell you, you can make an exception this time. <coughs> but the human fleshly wisdom, when it contradicts godly wisdom, is always wrong. It's always wrong. And it always makes your problem worse. God will give you what you need. But you got to listen. you got to read it. He's written it down for you. you got to pay attention. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll put your faith in it without doubt. If there's anybody here who hasn't given heed to God's wisdom. Do it before it's too late. God's wisdom is simple and it's profound. And it says you have to give your life to Christ. It says you have to put your faith in Jesus. It says you have to confess your faith in front of other people. It says you have to repent of your sins. It says you have to be immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You know what to do. You know how to do it. If you don't know how to do it, we'll help you do it. We'll show you. You know when to do it. When to do it is right now. Because if you try to do it when it's too late, it'll be the wrong time. And then it's not wisdom at all. Because done at the wrong time doesn't work. And after death comes the judgment. There will be no surrendering to God after you die. There will be no taking advantage of the blood of Christ after you die. That will be the wrong time. Now is the right time. Today is the day of salvation. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ, make right what you've done wrong, ask for prayers of the church, whatever your need may be, Please come down front as we stand and sing.